One line in that song says, I have no regrets. If I were to have a regret, it would be my own. It would be how much I've not done for the Lord. It would be how much I have failed him. But he sure ain't never failed me. He ain't never let me down. He ain't never done me wrong. And I know the, I know, I know the, the English ain't good and the grammar ain't good, but he ain't never been nothing but good to me. Bad, bad grammar, good theology, I guess. We're going to be in Colossians chapter 3 tonight. Colossians chapter 3. I appreciate all of you being out tonight. I'm going to ask you to continue to pray for me. I've mentioned it in the prayer room. I've mentioned it to a few folks in here tonight. Uh, past couple weeks have been sick. Um, been uh, sinus congestion. And I'm the kind of guy that whenever I get that and I get a cough, I'll keep a dry cough for about two or three weeks. So, so uh, I don't know how this is going to go tonight, but we trust in the Lord regardless. Um, I don't believe that his word's going to go void. The Bible says that it won't return void, the Bible says. The Bible also says in Isaiah chapter 58, verse 1, to cry out with a loud voice um, and show the people their, their transgressions, talking about preaching. And I'm not, not going to be the guy that I'm going to promise you that I'm going to be loud like normal, but I might be. We don't know. We're just going to roll the dice. We're going to trust the Lord that he's going to... He's going uh, to provide what I need. He might shut up this cough for about the next 30, 45 minutes. I don't know. But we're just going to trust God. He knows best. Amen. Amen. Colossians chapter 3. Brother Sean the other night, he made me sort of nervous whenever he mentioned the, word, the book of Colossians because I did mention this morning in Sunday school that I've had this message on my heart for the past few weeks. Uh, I thought it was going to be a nursing home message, but uh, it turned out it's going to be for here tonight. Um, I've had this thought for a few weeks now. And uh, I really didn't, didn't write the, the final draft of my outline until yesterday. The uh, Lord's kind of been, been sort of chewing on it for the past few weeks. So we're just going to trust him. And Brother Sean got up here the other night and said, turn to the book of Colossians. And he paused about whenever he, what chapter he said. I was thinking, Lord, he's going to preach my message because there's only four chapters in here. But if he did, it would have been all right. Lord would give me something. Colossians chapter 3, a familiar passage of Scripture if you've been saved and in the Bible any amount of time. Verse number 23. We're going to finish up these last few verses right here. The Bible says, And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men. Knowing that, the, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye, have, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Uh, I'm going to read that verse again. I had that thing all mixed up. Knowing that ye... Uh, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive the wrong which he hath done. And there is no respect of persons. I want to preach a message this evening, just a simple thought titled, Living for the Lord. Living for the Lord. We're going to pray real quick. Pray with me if you would. Father, I thank you for the day. God, I thank you for this opportunity you've given. Lord, I thank you, God, for the time that you've given us here. Thank you, God, for, for Victory Baptist Church and these people and what they mean to me. Lord, I've only been here for a little while, but I love them. Lord, I appreciate uh, you, you blessing us so richly with such, uh, such wonderful people. Lord, I pray, God, a special blessing on each one of these folks tonight. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you just help me to preach with power, with authority, with conviction. And I uh, pray you'd fill me with your Holy Spirit tonight, God. I pray that you'd be with our pastor as he's gone. I pray that you just give him traveling mercy. Lord, I pray that you just touch him, bless him, help him. Lord, I pray that you just help us tonight, Lord, as we get in your word. I pray, Lord, that you just help me to preach for that which you've given me. Nothing more, nothing less. Father, I pray that you just move in a mighty way here tonight. I thank you, God, for all that you do. I love you and appreciate you. In Jesus' name, amen. Like I said, I'm going to be preaching a message titled, Living for the Lord. I had another title in mind, but the Lord says, no, we're going to change that, which titles, you know, that's really not the inspired part of it. The inspired part is what we read of the scripture, and then the Lord leads us to expound in certain ways. But um, the thing that I've, I noticed this afternoon, I kind of got to looking, and there's some people that believe that the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. Whether he did or didn't, there's an argument going on. He did or he didn't. Who wrote it? I don't know. I don't care. But every other, every other Pauline epistle that we see is written to Gentiles. He wrote to the Gentile nations. He wrote to the Gentile people because in, in Romans chapter 11, verse 13, he claimed himself, I am the Apostle to the Gentiles. If we were to have an apostle tonight, it would be the apostle Paul because he is the apostle to the Gentiles. If you were to look throughout the New Testament, all the Pauline apostles, that's where we get the majority of our doctrine tonight. We, of course, through the gospels, what the Lord Jesus himself taught, but later on in life, after the book of Acts, which is a historical book, and then once you get into Romans, all the way through the rest is where we get a lot of
of our doctrine tonight. And this is where we get some of our doctrine out of the book of Colossians because Paul here was writing to the Gentile church at Colossae. Colossia. Now, or Col Colossae, whatever, how you say it. It says, well, now with that in mind, um, Paul did write this to the church, of, uh, in, uh, the, the church of the Colossians, but it still applies to us tonight. Now, I want you to understand that the Bible still applies to us. It don't matter anywhere from Genesis chapter 1 to Revelation chapter 22. Anything in there is profitable for doctrine, Amen. the Bible says. Yeah. It can be taught. It can be preached. Right. It, can, it can. All of this stuff can be applied to our life, and we can become better Christians because of it. And I want you to understand that's just kind of a thought that I have as a segue into this message tonight. Now, look what the Bible says. Paul wrote this, and, and like Brother John mentioned this morning, a lot of times we have to look and see who, who he wrote it to. If we were to look in, uh, let me flip over and find the right place here. In Colossians chapter 1, in verse, uh, verse 2, it says, To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ. That's who he wrote this to. This is to the church. This is to the Christian people. Now granted, can people get saved off of this? Absolutely. But he wrote this primarily to the Christians, to the believers in the, at, the, at the Colossian church. And the first thing I want us to notice here in our text, it says, and I read in verse 23, it says, And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. The first thing I want us to see about living for the Lord is the what? I see the what. In the first part of verse 23, he says, And whatsoever ye do. It's real easy a lot of times to sit here and say, Well, I'm living for the Lord. How are you living for the Lord? Well, we're going to church. We go on Sunday morning. We might go to Sunday school. We may go Sunday night. We may go Wednesday night. That is not living for the Lord. I want you to understand, we should be at church. I'm not taking anything away from church attendance. We should be faithful to the things of God. But living for the Lord takes place outside of the walls. It's what you do every day, Monday through Friday, Monday through Saturday, when you're away from the, the things of God, when you're away from the people of God, when it's just you at your workplace, when it's you at your school, you can still live for the Lord there. And we are to do everything, everywhere we go, with everything that we've got, living for the Lord. Now, granted, again, like I say, I'm not taking anything away from, from church attendance and doing things within the church. Of course, we've got Sunday school teachers here. I'm one of them, and I'm thankful for it. But my service to the Lord is not just what I do within the walls and on the property here at Victory Baptist Church. I still have a ministry at home with my wife and with my kids. I still, every day, I have to go and do things, you know, you know, normal everyday life things. You still, we are supposed to do everything that we do, whatsoever you do, or whatever you do, do it heartily unto the Lord. Everything that you do, I don't care where you're at, what you're doing, it is supposed to be with everything you got to the Lord, not unto men. Amen. <coughs> so what are we supposed to do? You know, I, I, I sit here, a lot of times I reference reference uh, sports teams because that's what I can relate to. It's what works for me. Sorry, if y'all don't understand, if y'all don't follow sports and can't pick up what I'm putting down, I'm sorry. It's just how I, how I communicate, how I understand things. Do you realize people on sports teams, everybody has a role? Yeah. Yes, sir. Not everybody on the football team can be the quarterback. No, that's true. Not everybody on that, on that football team can be the, uh, the wide receiver or the running back or the linebacker. Do you know the center is still a, a very vital position? Do you understand that the, 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 the right guard is still a, a, a vital position? Yeah. All of these things have to work together. And if everybody does their job, you might win a ball game. Mm -hmm. The body of Christ is the same thing. We are all have a job. Right. Look, not everybody's called to be a preacher. Not everybody's called to be a teacher. Not everybody's called to be a deacon. Not everybody's called to sing. But when we all do what we're supposed to do together and we all work together, guess what's going to happen? The Lord's going to get some glory out of it. So whatsoever you do, do it heartily unto the Lord. Yeah. You know, although our roles may be different, we still have the same common goal. Reaching the lost and dying world for the Lord Jesus Christ. That is, should be our end goal. I don't care how we go about doing it. And I'm very cautious a lot of times whenever I stand up here. I'm real cautious about, about mentioning preachers' names. Because when you mention, sometimes you mention a certain preacher's name, people automatically turn you off, so you're one of them. And I'm real cautious about that because a lot of times, you know, we get judged based on who we listen to or who we read behind or who we follow. But I want you to realize this evening, I'm going to mention a preacher's name, and I heard him say this in person, live under his preaching one night, or he wasn't preaching, but he was moderating the service, and it was Brother Mark Stroud. He was at the Power of Two youth meeting last fall, I think it was, last year. Trey and I were there, and uh, he said, 
or he might have said he might have said it over at a preaching arrival. Anyways, Mark Stroud was talking about his power of two thing, and he said that there was one night. That Friday night, you know, there's a bunch of young preachers, a bunch of youngins there, a bunch of teenagers. And he said, boys, he said, all you preacher boys, he said, I want you to meet over here an hour or two before the service in the morning. He gave them a time. He said, I want you to be over here, and I'm going to teach you some stuff about ministry. Now, if you understand, if you know who Mark Stroud is, Brother Mark, I love Brother Mark. He, uh, he's a pastor, been a pastor at Wahoo Baptist Church over in Lumpkin County for the past 20-some-odd years. Been in evangelism. He's preaching somewhere all the time. And this is one of these guys that these young men look up to greatly and think, well, if that man is going to tell me something about ministry, I'm going to sit and I'm going to listen. Well, they showed up that morning, had their suits and ties on. They was ready to come to church. They had their King James Bibles in their lap, and they was all on the front row. And they were sitting there just, just chomping at the bit to hear what the man of God was going to tell them. And he had something up there covered up with a blanket. And he said, boys, you want to know the secret to ministry? You want to know how to get down to the, the nitty-gritty of the ministry? He walks over and he pulls that blanket back and it was a broom and a mop bucket. Yeah. Uh, right. uh -huh. He said, preachers, only about 20% of your ministry is going to be preaching. And now, I've never pastored a church, but there's a pastor friend of mine. He told me the other day, he said, you don't understand. He said, preaching is the easy part of pastoring. He said, I have to, he said, I wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning with some of my church members on my heart. He said, I get up. I don't know what they're dealing with, but I'm crying and praying for them and begging God to deal with them or to help them out in the middle of the night. He said, God gives me messages late at night. He said, I, he said, he said, you, he said, preaching is the easy part of it. He said, the hard part is the counseling, having to deal with the death and the dying. And the thing is, everything that we are to do, I don't care what you're supposed to do. Just like Brother Mark Stroud was showing those guys to get a broom and a mop bucket. Everything you do should be done for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah, man. <laughs> everything we do. He says, whatsoever you do. It's not just whenever. I remember when I was first called to preach. Lord, forgive me for this. And I've already... We've already had a conversation about it. it was a long time ago. I stood there, and when I first got called to preach, I thought, boy, I have arrived. Look at me. I am that guy. I have graduated above taking up the offering. I have graduated above all these other different things because I'm the preacher. And that's a pharisaical attitude if there ever was one. I want you to understand, I don't care how high up you get, how far along you go, or how mature you get in your spirituality, we still have to get low to help people. And that is what we're supposed to do. God has called us to make a difference in people's lives. It's not necessarily just preaching the gospel behind the pulpit. It's not necessarily teaching a Sunday school class. It's not necessarily doing all of these great and mighty things that we think is great and mighty. Whatsoever you do, do it for the Lord. Amen. Get low, help people. Humble yourselves. Not only do I see the what, I also see the how. So what are we to do? Secondly, how are we to do it? In verse 23, I just hit on it a little bit. It says, do it heartily as to the Lord. Now notice, first of all, whatsoever we do, do it heartily as to the Lord. There's a lot of people a lot of times that think, well, well I'm above that. Just like I mentioned a minute ago, I'm the guy that, 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 that I'm above this. Oh, so you want me to sweep the floor? Okay, well, I'll just eh, halfway do it. Do it heartily. Amen. You know, I remember, I remember do, everything you got, you're supposed to give it to God. Yeah. Everything you do. I remember at one time, um, a, lot of times, a lot of times we are known when we're at our job site or, or, or kids are at school, we're known to turn it on a little bit. When the boss walks by, we're working extra hard. When the, when the school teacher looks at you, you're going to work a little harder on that test, make it look like you're working. Or maybe you're digging a little bit deeper in that book to try to find the right answers. Or you're taking those notes that they told you to write down. But if, when they're not around, we don't really pay attention a lot of times. It happens in our churches as well. When the pastor's gone, a lot of times people don't come to church because the pastor ain't there. The cat's away. The mice are going to play. I'm going to go off and do my own thing because the pastor's not there. Nobody cares if I show up or not. Can I tell you, no matter what you're to do, no matter who's around, who isn't around, you're supposed to do it all with everything you've got. <laughs> that, that goes for schoolwork. That goes for, for your job. That goes for, for doing everything in your home. That goes for all, even the, the, what we consider the, the things that don't matter to the things that matter the most. Everything you do, give everything you've got. That's what God called us to do. He says, he says, he says here in verse 23, whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men. Because when that boss walks by, he's going to say, boy, he sure is working hard. I'm going, 
I'm going to kind of help him out a little bit. I'm going to kind of give him, I'm going to give him an extra slice of pizza. We're not going to give him a raise, but we're going to make give him, we're going to put his name on the board or something or other. But you're doing it for men. You can fool men. You can't fool God. You can't fool God. So first thing I see is the what. What are we doing? What are we to do to live for the Lord? Secondly, how are we to live for the Lord? Thirdly, the why. Why should we do it? Verse 24 says, uh, so verse 23 says, And whatsoever you do, do it heartily unto the Lord, as, unto, as to the Lord and not unto men. Verse 24 says, Why? Knowing that the Lord shall receive the reward of the inheritance. Amen. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. For ye serve the Lord Christ. And when I opened this first opened this thing, I did mention that Paul wrote this to the saints and the believers in, in, in the Colossian church, right? I did mention that, that in verse 1, verse 2 of chapter 1 says that's who he's writing to. Paul always does that in a salutation. He always says, Paul, an apostle of the Lord Jesus, or servant of the Lord, whatever he always goes through. And he says, I'm writing this to these people. If you ever wonder who the particular letters are written to, read the first few verses. He'll let you know. But he's writing this to the Christians. Not only because he said he's writing it to the Christians, but look at the end of verse 24. He says, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Amen. Lost people don't serve the Lord Christ. My brother John said this morning, he did mention, he said, even though they're lost, God's still getting glory somehow out of what they're doing. But do you understand that we are, we, he's talking to the Christians here. Ye serve the Lord Christ. So why should we do what we're, why should we do our best? Because we are serving the Lord Christ. I think a lot of times, I think a lot of times, and I, and I hope I'm wrong on this, but I think a lot of times we think in our mind that because we read of this, this Jesus on paper, that we get a, a misconception of who he is, and we, we're like, well, I'm a preacher, or I'm a Christian, I attend Victory Baptist, or I'm an independent fundamental Baptist. We get in our mind that we can kind of have a little bit more grace, and we can do a little bit more of what we want to. we got a little more leniency because we're closer to the Lord. But can I tell you, we are still to serve the Lord Christ. I don't care what you do. I don't care what you say. I don't care how you go about doing it. But you are to do it with everything you can to bring glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. For ye serve the Lord Christ. That is why. So that's my introduction. If we see the what. So what are we doing to live for the Lord? The how. How are we living for the Lord? The why. Why are we living for the Lord? <laughs> why are you doing what you're doing? And now to get into the message. Now that we've covered all of that by way of introduction, the what, the how, the why, how are we to go about doing it? What do we do? How do we do? Why? But how do we go about doing all these things? How do we go about knowing that we're living for the Lord? If we go back to verse number one and two in chapter three, we'll see the lengthen, we are to lengthen our looking. Verse number 1 and 2 of chapter 3, it says, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, which are where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. Two, two times here Paul tells us to, to look above. He says in verse 1, he said, Seek those things which are above. Verse 2, Set your affection on things above. We are to lengthen our looking. Now I know the Bible does teach us that the, that the Word of God is a lamp in our feet and a light in our path. Saying so basically we illuminate the this right here, that we only need to worry about what's going on right now. But I do want you to understand, we are to lengthen our looking. We are to look out to eternity. The things that we're doing on this earth. Now I understand that there's a reason we go to work every day. I know we have bills to pay. I know we need to pay attention to the maintenance of our home and in our vehicles. There's things that we have to do to maintain those things. I understand we have to work in order to, to keep food in the pantry. I get all that. Well, I understand why we have to do all this. But we don't need to worry so much about the carnal things of this life. If you will look to the heavens, if you'll look above if you'll keep your affections on the things above, if you'll look to the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ will provide for you all the things which you need and bring glory and honor to his name. Amen. Amen. But we are to lengthen our looking. Secondly, not only are we to lengthen our looking, look in verse 5, we are to lighten our load. The Bible says in verse 5, he says, mortify your members, mortify therefore your members which are upon earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil uh, concupiscence, concupiscence <laughs> and covetous, covetousness, which is idolatry. For those things which, for, uh, for, for which things sake the, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. He tells us to lighten our load. There's things that we're carrying 
There's things that we're dealing with. The Bible says in the first word in verse 5, it says to mortify those things. Do you understand what mortify means? Mortify means to subdue, to abase, to humble, to reduce, or to restrain. You know, in my mind, I see the word mortify, I think dead. A mortician. You, when we, when, when, when uh, you th- talk about someone who is mortally wounded, is unto death, or fatally wounded, mortally wounded. Those words are interchangeable. And a mortician is an undertaker, a, a funeral director type thing. So when we mortify something, we are to, to do away with it. We are to die to those sins. We are to kill those things off in our life. If you want to grow in the Lord, you've got to get rid of some stuff. Yeah, and you know, I remember when I was a kid, my mama, <coughs> excuse me, even to this day, my mama loves having potted plants and flowers and stuff at her house. And every so often, she'd get out there with some pruning shears, and she'd go to trimming on this stuff. Mama, why are you doing that? She said, I'm cutting off the bad so it'll grow good. I'm cutting off the dead stuff so it'll grow. I'm pruning, getting rid of the bad things so it'll flourish. Do you understand that's what the Bible is teaching us right here? A lot of times we'll look and a lot of times people will think for, they'll say, well, God says I can't do this. God says I can't do that. God says this ain't, he's just a bully. Can I tell you, when I was growing up, when I was growing up, I had to deal with bullies too. I had to deal with bullies in school too. My clothes weren't good enough. I got made fun of for the clothes I wore. I got made fun of for the way I talked. And when I got saved, I got made fun of for being a Christian. People was bullying me all the time. And a lot of people look at the Lord Jesus Christ and look at Bible, the Bible and they think that God is a bully because he says, you can't do this. You can't do that. Don't do this anymore. Don't do that. But can I tell you, it's not because he's bullying us. He's trying to prevent us from going down a life of sin that will be destructive to our lives. God is trying to protect us. And a lot of times, even as a parent, my kids will say, Daddy, can I do this? No, I don't think that's a good idea. Well, Daddy, you don't want me to have fun. No, Daddy's trying to protect you because he sees something that you don't see. He's been there. He's done some things. He's seen some things that you can't see just yet. Daddy has knows a little more than you do. You got to trust that the Lord Jesus Christ knows more than we do. In verse 5, God gives us the things to kill off and to mortify and to get rid of. And not only in verse 5, we see it also also in uh, in verse 8. If you look down at verse 8, it says, uh, But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Now there's another list of things that we're supposed to get rid of, anger, malice, and all these different things. And all that right there, just like Brother John mentioned this morning, said one of the greatest sins we have to deal with is pride. If you can avoid your pride, you believe, I believe you can avoid a lot of this. I really believe that because if you're prideful, guess what? You're going to fly mad real quick. And then when you get mad, then you're going to act out on it. There's going to be your wrath and you're going to do it with evil intent. There's your malice. And then you're going to get mad at God and you're going to blaspheme. And guess what's next? Filthy communication. I remember when I was running for any time, any time in my life that I've tried my best to live for the Lord, the dirty communication wasn't there. Why? Why? Did, did Paul feel to write all of these vague things? If I get mad, there's no telling what I'm going to do. There's going to be wrath. He, he kind of just gives umbrella terms for all these things, but then he follows it up very particular and says filthy communication. And he says, let filthy communication out of your mouth. Why did he particularly pick that one out? So evidently the, church, the Colossian church had a problem with their, their language. Youngins, I want you to listen to me. All you kids sitting right up here. Just because your buddies is doing it, and just because it sounds cool at school, and it makes you fit in, it makes you weak. Everybody calls those words sentence enhancers. The Bible right here clearly tells you to not do it. The Bible also says, I don't know exact book, chapter, and verse, but it basically says, uh, uh, refrain from all profane and vain babblings. Why? Because they will lead to further ungodliness. I remember there was a years ago, a few not well not long ago, last year, year before last, a couple of years back, I used to shoot competition archery. And uh, with that, um, there were some of us that rode together to these tournaments. And I'm talking about this was we were on a national scale. We'd go to Louisiana, Kentucky, uh, Illinois. We'd go all over the southeast shooting, and some in the Midwest. <coughs> this we was going down the road, and this one fella he sits there and he tells a dirty joke. Now, you expect lost people to tell dirty jokes. But this man claimed to be a Christian, faithful to his church. 
And the fellow sitting in the front seat kind of gave him a courtesy laugh just so it wouldn't be awkward. And he says, you didn't get the joke, did you? You didn't think it was funny. You didn't laugh. You didn't get it. I said, I got it. But you're right. I don't think it's funny. Amen. There's certain things we don't need to be talking about. Just because somebody else talks about it don't make it okay. Just because Hollywood uses that dirty language don't mean you should. The Bible here clearly says avoid the filthy communication. I don't care how much the Lord or how much the world thinks it's okay to do it. It's not okay. That language is dirty. That language is rotten. That language is wrong. I don't care if there's any, you know, we got our sipping saints and we got our cussing saints. And I ain't neither one of them right. Ain't neither one of them right. The Bible says do away with the filthy communication out of your mouth. Now look at what else it says in verse number 9. It says, lie not one to another. Wow. Seeing that you, that you have put off the old man with his deeds. Now look right there. If you notice that, notice how that's written. He says, lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. Yeah. If you're saved, lying is a deed of the old man. The Bible says it's even one of the Ten Commandments. You shall not bear false witness. So, do you think, I, being as Paul wrote right here, the Lord felt the need to put in two verses right here in the book of Colossians chapter 3. Do you not think, it, considering that the Lord put it on Paul's heart to write it right there, don't you think it's important to the Lord how we communicate? Amen. Right. Yeah. The Bible also says, uh, I forget exactly where it's at, but it says um, uh, avoid the corrupt communication. Yeah. And a lot of people say, well, that don't mean cussing. Well, what else does it mean? Yeah, it might mean gossiping, it might mean backbiting, it might mean murmuring, it might mean all these other things. But corrupt communication is corrupt communication. I don't care what you think, corruption is corruption. I don't care how far you look at it, corruption is wrong, it's wrong, you ought not do it. Good things ought to come from our mouth. The Bible also says in the book of James that, that you ought not be, um, uh, uh, there ought not be, you know, uh, good water, sweet water, and bitter water can't, from the, can't come from the same fountain or something along those lines. Blessings and cursings can't come from the same mouth. Understand this. If the Lord moves in, he's going to change your language. The Lord moves in, he's going to change what you say and the way you say things. There was a guy I went to high school with, and I remember I likened it to a story that, that uh, Jerry Clower told. Some of you youngins don't know who Jerry Clower is, but Jerry Clower was a great comedian. I thought it was hilarious. Uh, he said a lot of funny things. But one of, the famous, one of the things that he said that I say a lot of times, that fellow would rather climb a tree and tell you a lie than to stand on the ground and tell you the truth. And what that means is there are certain people in your life that they will go to great lengths just to lie rather than just tell the truth. And there's a guy that I know that I went to high school with. He, we were great friends. He's still a good guy. I see him every now and then. He's one of those kind of people. He can walk in that door right there and kind of wave at you and say, how are you doing, and have you laughing. He's just a funny guy. And he's one of those kind that he feels that he needs to lie about everything. He's one of those kind that if he says the sun's shining, I'd have to go outside to look because I don't believe nothing he says. But he's also one of them. He come, I saw him the other day a while back. We was talking. He said, well, he said, I guess I'm finna start preaching. I said, well, glory to God. When did you get saved? And he got to told me about all this stuff. He said, yeah. He said, I reckon I'm going to start preaching. And then what? But three breaths later, he starts using them sentence enhancers that I just said you ought not be using. Make up your mind, man. Are you going to live for the Lord or not? Look, listen. Listen, I want you to understand something. I try my best. I fail at this, but I do my dead level best. The Mike Andrews you see on Sunday and Wednesday at church is the same Mike Andrews that's at work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and at the nursing home on Saturday. I try my best to be the same person all the time. I try not to be fake because here's the thing. It's hard to keep up with just one of me. I couldn't imagine trying to keep up with two or three of me. But here's the thing. I want to, understand, I want to ask you all this. How is your conversation away from church? Are, are, is John Wilder the John, same John Wilder at church as he is at the Granite Shed? Is he the same guy? Are you the same guy at work or the same woman at work or the same young at school as you are at church? Amen. The Bible says that we are to, 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 to uh, make sure that our communication is right. Yeah. Our communication is good. <coughs> and that verse was, that, that was, so I see the lengthen, to we're to lengthen our look and we're to lighten our load. That, I, I didn't give that point. That was to lessen our lying. And number four, we are to let the Lord. This is how you live for the Lord. Let the Lord. In verses uh, 15 and 16, it says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body. And be ye thankful. Verse 16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, 
teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Amen. So we are to let the Lord. How do we let the Lord? It says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. How do you have peace of God? It's one thing to have peace of God, but it's another thing to have peace with God. How do you get all that? And how do we, how do we get, let the, the word of quiet Christ dwell in us richly in wisdom? How do you do that? By studying his word. If you want to let his, how are you going to let the, the word of Christ dwell in you richly if you don't get in his word? It, it can't dwell in you if you don't dwell in it. Amen. It won't dwell in you if you don't dwell in it. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how young you are. I don't care how long you've been saved or how little bit of a time you've been saved. We all get our help from the same place. And it's through the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's through the pages of those holy scriptures. I don't. I, what really baffles me, I've said this many times. I've been saved. I've been doing this for about 29 years. And I sit here and I'll read the Bible. And I read, through the, I read through the New Testament pretty quick after I got saved, and I saw some pretty good things, things I didn't understand. But now that I'm a little older into my Christian walk and in my Christian spirituality, I see some things now, and I say, wow, that's really amazing. But guess what? It's still very basic. Because I want you to realize tonight that, that it don't care how long you've been saved. The Word of God is still just as just as just as important to the, to the veteran Christian as it is to the rookie Christian. I don't care how long you've been saved. You can take that passage of scripture. I mentioned it one time before. Uh, Proverbs, or not Proverbs, Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. That's all it says. Amen. If I tell that, if, if a brand new baby Christian has been saved for just a few weeks and they don't know nothing about the Bible, you give them that, they say, wow, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. They immediately think that what they, they know what a shepherd is. The shepherd is somebody that's going to take care of the sheep. And I shall not want. He's going to give me everything I need. This is exactly what it says. But as a Christian, as somebody that's been doing this for 29 years, I know a little bit more about the shepherd. I know a little bit more about the significance of the shepherd. I know that the shepherd's got to protect the sheep. Not only is he going to provide, he's going to protect, and he's going to take care of all of our needs. That's the, that's the great thing about the Bible, and someone who's been saved longer than me can go much farther in depth in that verse. That's the great thing about your Bible, youngins. Listen, once you read it, read it again. Then you read it a second time, read it a third time. You read it then and read it again. Keep reading your Bible. Stay within your Scripture because you will the word, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. It'll dwell in you if you dwell in it. Amen. So not only let's see the length, we need to lengthen our looking, we need to lighten our load, we need to lessen our line, we need to let the Lord, and lastly, we need to love our labor. Amen. Verse 14, right here, this, this kind of, I don't know what it is about when the days that Brother John and I both preach together on the same days, it seems like a lot of times our, what we say echoes one another. Verse 14, and above all these things, and above all these things, Above all these things, above, basically above everything else, above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Again, like what Brother John said this morning, I don't care how much you got, I don't care how much you know, faith, peace, and uh, charity, or faith, hope, and charity, of these things, charity is the greatest, Okay. I don't care how much, how much you know. I don't care how, much, how smart you are. I don't care how long you've been saved. If you don't have love in your heart one for another, there's something wrong. Amen. There's something missing. Yeah. Yeah, the church we came from, the pastor of that church which we came from, he said one day, he said this several times, and I completely agree with it. He said, people don't care how much you know till they know how much you care. Amen. If you don't love people, they don't care how much you know about the Bible. I remember we went on a mission trip to New Orleans back in... 2010, I think. It was five years after Hurricane Katrina, so I think it was in 05. So I think it was 2010 when we went with the church we used to go to. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry, y'all. Got this cough. They, uh, they, they told us, they said, uh, they said, and I was on, we were on a construction team. I was a bus driver for a construction team or a van driver. I would drive to the school. We'd work all day. They'd, we'd take our lunch and all this stuff, and we'd go back that evening anyway. We, uh, they told us, they said, even though you're not on the ministry team, which was doing Bible schools and stuff like that. You're doing physical labor. They said, still look for opportunities to tell somebody about Jesus. Okay? We were working at a school in downtown New Orleans. And I saw a couple of guys out there uh, sitting on the tailgate of a truck about dinner time. I walk up. I was like, hey, man, let me tell you about the Lord. And they was just like. And I was like, God loves you. He wants to save you. He loves you so much. You, you know, the, the bland just going through the motions. 
And I was thinking, man, there's got to be something more to this. There's got to be something more. Well, Wednesday afternoon, we were staying in a church. Wednesday afternoon, when we got done working, we didn't have a church service that night because the church was having their service. So they just gave us that Wednesday night off. And we went down to the, the French Quarter in New Orleans. And I walked in, and they said, find some, they've been telling us, find somebody that's got like interests. And I, and I had a group of guys with me, and I said, boys, I said, if you're going to me, you better come on, because there's a fellow right over there on the bank of the Mississippi River playing a guitar. And I was big in music at the time. I tore out, and I went to that guy. And he was, like, and he was a super nice guy. His name was Shane. I don't know whatever happened to Shane. This has been 14 years ago. I said, we were sitting there talking. I said, yes, I'm down here on a mission trip. And it was like, that's when the Lord started speaking through me. It was one thing to share the gospel blindly without any love just to do it. But I was sitting there, I was like, man, listen, this is what the Bible teaches. He said, the jury's out for me on that, man. That was his words. He said, the jury's still out for me on that. And I don't know whatever happened with Shane. I said, well, do you mind if I pray with you? He said, no, I'd rather not. I said, well, and in my mind, I didn't say this, but I was thinking, you can stop me from praying with you, but you can't stop me from praying for you. And then I went and I met back up with our group and we were sitting in a restaurant that night and I was sitting there telling the story to some of, these, some of the other men that were there and I, the tears just started flowing. Because that is the gospel. Not just telling it. Well, of course the Bible says we're to tell the gospel, we're to preach the word, but we're to preach it with love. We're to preach the truth in love, with compassion. Because people are dying and going to hell. So that is our labor, to, to do it in love. Ms. Moss, would you come, please? I appreciate you being here tonight. So are you living for the Lord? Lengthen your looking, lighten your load, lessen the lying, let the Lord and love the labor.